do and give you guys a little bit of an introduction into what the presentation is going to be about. Um, so obviously this is me. Uh, this is my mom. This is Easter 1991 at my grandparents' house in Southern West Virginia. Um, pretty classic, typical Easter West Virginia setting in rural West Virginia, dirt road, um, picket, you know, white fence, tulips, some crazy 90s uh, fashion going on here too as well. Uh, mountains in the background. Uh, and so, you know, this is my, my home area growing up and this is where we, where you lived and, and uh, where I grew up. And then this, uh, if anybody's a fan of photography and kind of mid 19th or mid 20th century US Americana photography, you may recognize this photo. Um, this is a photo by um, O. Winston Link um, titled Hot Shot Eastbound. Uh, it was actually taken in my hometown of Yeager, West Virginia, where I went to high school at. Um, 1956, uh, about the same time Ansel Adams was involved in black and white landscape uh, American photography. Mr. Link got pretty famous doing quote unquote Americana at the time. Um, and he was kind of instrumental in developing night flash photography and linking multiple flashes in a series uh, to where they would all go off at once. And if one failed, all of them uh, would not go off and not ruin the, the, the flashes because they were one use at the time. And so he used 56 uh, separate flashes linked up in a series to get this uh, one photo and, you know, uh, weeks of preparation to time the, the train and monitoring every night where the train was going, um, what time it went by. And, uh, you know, it's uh, pretty famous. Uh, I've seen it all across the country and, in, 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 you know, areas where people have black and white photography. It's pretty cool to know that this came from my hometown. So um, I have no disclosures. So why did I pick West Virginia history as my um, grand rounds? I was told uh, it didn't have to be something medically related and something near and dear to me. Um, I can't think of anything really that's been more important in my life than, than this state. Uh, it gave me my family. Um, yeah, it's my whole entire education from kindergarten through my uh, surgical residency has been through uh, public education here in West Virginia. Um, and it's just, uh, it's been instrumental in, in where I'm at today. Um, hopefully I can give you not just names, dates, and facts, but some actual stories and probably some stories you haven't heard of, but if you have heard of them, then, um, hopefully it's, a, some new facts that you haven't, uh, didn't realize were associated with that story. And then what expertise do I have in West Virginia history and to talk about this? Well, let me start by telling you a little story about the Golden Horseshoe Expedition. Um, this was in the early 1700s. Uh, governor Spotswood uh, was appointed acting rural governor of Virginia, and he wanted to uh, find a way westward uh, to the Shenandoah Valley. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Just a second, I'm going to admit some people. Yep. Um, across the Blue Ridge Mountains, because at the time that was an impediment to settlement westward um, and to try to get into the, um, the fertile Shenandoah Valley, he wanted to find an easier way. Um, so he organized an expedition, uh, about 50 men, uh, three Native American guides traveled up the Rappahannock River. And this expedition included some uh, ancestors of some pretty instrumental uh, men uh, who were involved in the creation of our country. Uh, James Madison's uh, father or grandfather and George Mason's grandfather, uh, respectively, were involved. Um, they entered the Shenandoah Valley on the 6th of September, 1716. They promptly uh, had a big bonfire, had, uh, drank all their beer, drank all their rum, and then went home. Um, so this was more almost like a, a fraternity type expedition than an actual exploration. Um, the um, expedition failed to open up. Uh, uh, find a route across the Blue Ridge Mountains, and then most of the settlers eventually came south from Pennsylvania through the valley. Um, but one thing it did do that was long-lasting was following the expedition, um, Governor Spotswood handed out uh, small golden pins um, uh, in the shape of a, of a horseshoe uh, that had the Latin phrase on it. I'm not going to try to pronounce it, uh, but it translates to thus is pleasant to cross the mountains. Um, and this kind of, uh, this story kind of lives on in West Virginia lore today because these were kind of the, some of the first people to explore the, or first 
uh, Europeans to explore um, the Eastern Panhandle and the Potomac Highlands. Um, and in the late or early uh, 1900s, in an attempt to boost some state pride, as we were still a uh, pretty new state at the time, um, Phil Conley, no relation, who was uh, president of the West Virginia Club, and William Cook, who was the state superintendent of schools at the time, uh, came up with an idea for a competition um, uh, on West Virginia state history. And this ultimately led to all eighth graders in the state taking a course on West Virginia history in public schools. Uh, and at the end of that class, uh, they take a test and the uh, highest scoring students uh, on that test get inducted as a knight or lady of the Golden Horseshoe. Uh, you get to go to Charleston, you actually get knighted uh, as a knight or a lady, um, about 200 each year at this point do it and uh, get to uh, have that honor. Uh, and they get a small golden horseshoe pin, lapel pin, uh, just like you see here. Uh, and yes, I was able to uh, win uh, and be one of those 200 students, have my golden horseshoe pin here with me today. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor that I, I uh, cherish and a great memory. Um, so that's where my expertise comes from, I can claim. And yes, uh, if some of you may be asking, but you may call me Sir Conley, uh, since I am a knight. <laughs> Um, now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the original native West Virginians. Um, some of the first uh, humans uh, were in this part of the country, uh, what would eventually become West Virginia, uh, about 10,000 BC. Um, they ultimately were termed the Monongahela culture based on the river, obviously. Um, and one of the oldest settlements was actually discovered in the late uh, 1980s, early 90s. And was excavated uh, where the Suncrest Town Center is now. Um, so where the new Kroger's is now was one of these uh, culture settlements and burial grounds that was uh, had an archaeological dig prior to the development of that area, uh, it, turning into a, what is now a shopping center. So um, again, the Shawnee Cherokee, uh, Cherokee and the Iroquois all claimed uh, this area as hunting grounds, um, and um, you know, more of the well-known uh, Native American tribes all uh, uh, use this area as hunting grounds because of the abundant um, fauna. Uh, several tribes also use West Virginia as uh, sort of a long-term, uh, long-distance battlefield, um, uh, specifically the Seneca tribe from the Great Lakes region and the Catawba tribe uh, from the Carolinas were all involved, uh, uh, traveled great distances to have battles uh, on the area that uh, we call West Virginia today. Um, the first expedition, European expedition was in 1761, uh, Mr. Woods and Bats. Uh, they traveled deep into the Appalachian Mountains and discovered Kanawha Falls, uh, which is just a little bit north um, east of uh, Charleston on the Kanawha River. Um, they described the finding of the falls and, and there's actually a Kanawha Fe Falls Fest still today. Um, where people kayak and, and whitewater raft all across the falls. Uh, multiple expeditions followed, um, and this ultimately, um, you know, as, as Europeans did, led to the creation of land grants uh, and the, the um, giving out of the land to prominent men of the time. Um, uh, the Northern Neck Land Grant, which encompasses most of modern-day Eastern Panhandle and the Potomac Highlands, uh, which is kind of Pendleton County, Randolph County, where Elkins, uh, Thomas Davis uh, is. Uh, this land grant was created in 1660, um, and Thomas Jefferson's father, uh, Peter Jefferson, actually uh, was involved in some of the surveying of this land uh, in the mid-1700s. Ultimately, Lord Thomas Fairfax inherited this. Um, he was born in England and um, hired George Washington in 1748 when he was 16 years old. Uh, General, uh, President Washington's kind of first uh, occupation was as a surveyor. And so in 1748, uh, he surveyed this land. This was important because the two grants between Maryland and Virginia uh, designated the Potomac River as the border. Uh, and these were all going back to 1632, 1660, these land grants initially uh, given out by the kings of England. Um, and the source of the Potomac, uh, Lord Fairfax had a stone placed um, at that source because this kind of marked the primary border uh, boundary between Virginia and Maryland. 
Uh, this is important because the Maryland land grant given the word Baltimore marked the low water of the southern branch of the Potomac. Now at the time uh, in the early 1600s, no one knew that the Potomac branched into two main branches, the northern branch and the southern branch. Um, and this line, um, uh, this land grant talked about a north-south line extending from the um, source uh, west, marking the western boundary of Maryland. Um, and so the reason this is important that is Maryland wanted the southern branch to designate that line because then they would have all this extra land here. Um, this obviously led to a lot of legal disputes uh, between the two colonies and then two states um, as the southern branch extends further west. Um, ultimately, um, they continued to have uh, legal disputes while they were creating uh, counties all the same at the same time, uh, with uh, Virginia creating Montegalia County, which includes what is now Preston County as well, uh, and Maryland uh, creating the legal Allegheny County, which includes Garrett County, Maryland at this time as well. Uh, all the time, they're still fighting over this land, trying to figure out which um, branch of the Potomac would be the true boundary. Multiple surveys were, were set up over the years. Uh, the Maryland Assembly uh, hired a surveyor in 1788 to attempt to resolve this dispute. The Army Corps of Engineers got involved in 1859 to try to resolve this dispute. Um, ultimately, Maryland filed suit uh, and it made it all the way to the Supreme Court uh, in um, uh, 1889 and, or 1899. And the Supreme Court ruled 9-0 in favor of West Virginia uh, and the, the uh, northern branch of the Potomac uh, continues to this day as the boundary between the two states. Uh, you can actually visit the Fairfax Stone today. Uh, this is not the original one. This one was placed in the late mid 1800s, um, but this is just right outside of Thomas and Davis, West Virginia, which are two of my favorite towns to visit. Um, two old logging towns that have kind of had a, a, a renaissance with the, the local tourism industry and skiing industry in the last 20 or 30 years since the logging industry has left town. Um, great little restaurants, great little towns to visit and spend the weekend in. Uh, it's like an hour and a half drive from Morgantown. And then there's Blackwater Falls as well right there, which is one of our, our, our great national, uh, state parks and, and a, a great place to visit. I talked a little bit already about George Washington. Um, he's got some history in our state as well. Uh, he learned to be a surveyor at an early age, as we talked about, uh, and surveyed much of what is uh, what the area that I talked about with the Potomac Highlands and the Eastern Panhandle. Um, he also was instrumental in the creation of the Northwest Turnpike through Virginia. Uh, Virginia wanted an alternative to the Braddock Road, uh, which is the uh, pathway that Lord Br or General Braddock took during the French and Indian uh, War uh, with the, the British Army to get to Fort Necessity, um, which is just about 30 miles from here, right at Nimicolin Resort, where a large battle took place. General Braddock's actually buried there, uh, if, if anyone would like to visit. But um, this route went through Maryland and uh, Pennsylvania to get westward um, and actually parallels Route 40 uh, to this day, going through Uniontown. Um, but Washington wanted a, an alternative to this that stayed solely in Virginia to get from Winchester to Parkersburg, Virginia at the time. Uh, so he surveyed and came up with this, this route uh, that travels through much of the northern part of the state. And you can actually travel it today as US Route 50 through Grafton, Parsons, all the way to Parkersburg through Clarksburg. Um, really parallels the same route that, that General and then President Washington uh, took and he was instrumental in creating. Um, he was also spent a lot of time in the eastern part of the, uh, the eastern panhandle. Um, these three counties, Jefferson, Berkeley, Morgan County, um, also have a, a, a Washington Heritage Trail that you can actually follow his path uh, through the counties. Uh, some of the inns and, and areas that he stayed are still there to this day. Um, but one of the towns I want to emphasize is the Pawpaw, West Virginia, which is one of my also favorite little towns. Um, so Washington described this area that Pawpaw is in now, uh, and the quote you can see here with uh, 200 acres right next to the Potomac River with an abundance of walnut trees. And the town's actually named after the Pawpaw fruit, uh, which is the largest 
native fruit to North America. Um, it has, uh, if no one's ever tried it before, it has the texture of, the, of a banana and it kind of tastes like a cross between a mango and a papaya. Um, it really is like a, almost a tropical fruit that, that grows um, in some not so tropical climates. Um, this was George Washington's favorite fruit. He actually brought seeds back to Mount Vernon, had them planted throughout his estate. Uh, Thomas Jefferson also enjoyed this. He brought some and grew trees at, at Monticello. Uh, and he sent seeds back to France to his friends at, after he was um, ambassador to France. Um, and you can get some of these today. Um, it has a very short half-life or a half life, geez. Um, <laughs> very short shelf life, uh, only about three to five days once it's ripe. Uh, but Morgantown Brewing Company makes a really good beer out of it uh, that you can get in the fall when it's ripe. Um, so I'm going to move on. There's a million things I could talk about. Uh, the fact that Charlestown, West Virginia was established by George Washington's brother, Charles Washington. Uh, Daniel Boone spent most of his life in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Uh, was actually elected to the, the Virginia uh, Assembly from there and helped uh, uh, organize the local militia. And then there's John Brown's raid on the, um, the abolitionist John Brown and his raid on the federal uh, armory at um, um, Harper's Ferry uh, to, in order to try to uh, acquire arms for to lead a slave revolt uh, in 1859. And Robert E. Lee, actually, uh, all prior to the Civil War, was the uh, uh, commanding officer that led the federal troops uh, attack uh, to retake that uh, armory and capture John Brown. But I want to I want to talk about the creation of the state because I think this in and of itself is just a great story and and it goes through our history and and it's really interesting. Um, so even going back to the 1700s, there was talk about creating a colony and then a state from the western part of Virginia and Pennsylvania, uh, kind of the Blue Ridge and Appalachian Mountains obviously create a natural border. Uh, and these counties uh, did not, you know, the, the settlers in these counties did not relate to the Tidewater and Eastern Virginia uh, uh, people. They had completely different lives. Um, so in the late 1700s, uh, the colony of Vandalia uh, was proposed, uh, but ultimately did not get created. Um, and then after the Revolutionary War, there was the talk about creating a new state uh, from parts of western Pennsylvania and what is now eastern Ohio, uh, western Virginia, and what would ultimately be Kentucky, uh, called West Sylvania. Obviously, these states don't want to lose their territory, so this created very heated discussions, and Pennsylvania ultimately made it punishable by death to even talk about the potential state of Westsylvania. So that all fell through, obviously. But then the Civil War happened and Virginia voted to secede from the Union in 1861. Um, but 30 of the 49 delegates from what would ultimately become West Virginia, so that far majority voted against secession. Um, and you can see here, these are kind of the counties bordering Virginia were in favor of it, but all the Western counties and the Northern counties were against it along with the Eastern Panhandle. Um, so this led to a hastily assembled meeting in Clarksburg, uh, what was then Virginia. Um, and all that came from this meeting is that, well, we should have an official meeting. So then they moved to Willing um, and uh, held the first Willing Convention at West Virginia Independence Hall, which is in Willing and still stands to this day. Um, the first Willing Convention uh, just stated that if Virginia officially secedes from the Union, um, then they will call for a referendum and a vote on the creation of a new state, uh, declaring that what Richmond did was illegal because they did not do it through a pop popularly elected referendum, but the legislature voted to secede from the Union, uh, which obviously Virginia officially seceded on May 23rd. The second Willing Convention was held later in June, um, and they uh, established the Declaration of the People of Virginia, uh, this calls, called for the reorganization of the Virginia government uh, and uh, creation of a pro-union Virginia government in opposition of the government in Richmond. Uh, Lincoln and the Union and the U.S. government obviously approved this very quickly, um, and this led to the, the formation of the restored government of Virginia on June 19, 1861. Uh, Francis Pierpont was chosen as governor, or governor uh, and they quickly formed the legislature selected and seated two U.S. senators in the Senate, and the two U.S. representatives from this area uh, continued to hold their seats in the U.S. House, House of Representatives. This obviously created a conundrum because now we have two uh, governments of Virginia, both claiming legitimacy. 
Um, with that kind of conundrum, there's immediately calls for the creation of a new state. Um, but then we have to bring in this little thing called the U.S. Constitution, which lays out the process of a new state being admitted to the Union. And the Article 4, Section 3 talks about that if you're creating a state from an already established state, then you have to have the consent of that legislature from that state. Now, obviously, with these previous attempts, Virginia had already voted against that and never allowed for that to happen. But now we have a, quote unquote, new Virginia government in willing. Um, so they reconvened that convention um, and they uh, on August 20th, uh, the third willing convention was held and they called for the creation or the uh, a referendum on the creation of a new state that was held in October of that year. And uh, the vast, vast, vast majority uh, of people voted for the creation of the new state. Now, it should be said that of the almost not quite 20,000 votes that were cast, there were 70,000 qualified voters at that time in these territories. And of all those people who didn't vote, um, they considered themselves part of the Confederate States of America now, and so did not uh, want to be involved in a United States, uh, the Union, what they considered an illegitimate election because they were not part of the United States anymore. They were part of the Confederacy. So that's why you have a voter turnout uh, that's very low. But nevertheless, the referendum passed. Uh, and um, on December 3rd, uh, they had held a constitutional convention for the state of West Virginia. Uh, the initial state name of Kanawha, um, that was initially proposed, but that was struck down because there was a county and a river already named that, and they didn't want any confusion, obviously. Um, and so after several new uh, potential names, they ultimately settled on the state of West Virginia. Um, on May 13th, the restored Virginia government, which was kind of also the new West Virginia government, voted to approve uh, the creation of the new state. Uh, 1862 in December, they sent that to Congress, which was uh, approved. And then Lincoln, uh, President Lincoln signed in April 20th, 1863, uh, the bill. And 60 days later, West Virginia was admitted on June 20th, 1863, as a new state. Now, this obviously whole process immediately, was this even legal? Did we follow the, the uh, legality? And then this whole time, Berkeley and Jefferson County and the Eastern Panhandle were under military uh, occupation and they did not uh, participate in the election. So there was calls about whether they should still remain in the Commonwealth of Virginia or were they uh, counties in the new state. Um, so the restored government held an election uh, later in 1863 uh, again, voted for the creation of West Virginia, uh, and those two counties at that time voted to join uh, West Virginia. Uh, 1865, once the Civil War was over and the Virginia Assembly had reconvened in Richmond, uh, they held a um, uh, passed an act to repel all of this that happened and state that they did not give consent uh, for the creation of uh, a new state from their Western counties. But in March, 1866, the Congress, uh, US Congress passed a resolution, um, um, uh, both establishing the legality of the state of West Virginia and transferring the Berkeley and Jefferson County to the um, new state. Obviously, uh, Virginia then sued and we have uh, our second uh, US Supreme Court uh, case to involve West Virginia, this is 1871. Um, ultimately resulted in a 6-3 uh, decision in favor of West Virginia, uh, written by Justice Miller. Um, I won't go into the jurisprudence of this and bore everyone to death, but basically stated that the um, state had went through all the constitutional uh, requirements to create a new state and that Berkeley and Jefferson County were now part of West Virginia. And that's how we ended up with our 55 counties and our new state. Um, talk a little bit about the Civil War as this is going on. There was actually minimal fighting in the state that occurred. Um, most of it centered around uh, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And um, um, uh, that traveled through West Virginia uh, to get to Cincinnati, Chicago, uh, St. Louis. Um, but the first organized land battle actually took place here uh, about an hour and a half, two hours south in Philippi. Um, 1861. Uh, they were fighting over a covered bridge that's still there today that crosses the Tigert River and was a key choke point to get to kind of one of the main transfer points of the Baltimore and Ohio River. So on June 3rd, 1861, 
um, Union soldiers uh, came in to displace uh, the Confederate soldiers that were who were there, uh, and the Union soldiers promptly um, won the battle and uh, termed this the Philby Races uh, at the hastily, hastily retreat that the Confederate troops uh, participated in. Uh, one other battle uh, that is kind of interesting uh, is the Battle of Cheap Mountain, which is uh, over in uh, uh, Randolph County, uh, West Virginia, near Snowshoe, uh, uh, just just north of Snowshoe. Um, this was actually the first battle that Robert E. Lee commanded troops in, and um, George Washington's grand nephew, John Washington, who was the last private owner of Mount Vernon, uh, was killed in this battle. Um, now, my probably my favorite topic that I wanted to talk about today, the Hatfield-McCoy feud. Uh, some of you all may have heard about this before, um, but hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit more in depth that, that you can um, appreciate the story. Um, so the Hatfields were from West Virginia, the McCoys were from Kentucky, and they fought along this, this river here, the Tug Fork River, um, which was the border between the two states at the time, um, which is right next to where I grew up, which was right here in this little notch in McDowell County. Um, so I'm right where this all took place. Uh, the folklore is that this was all started over a pig, and while a pig was involved, it goes much deeper than that. Um, so the Hatfields were led by William Devilance Hatfield. Um, they fought for the Confederacy during the Civil War, and Devilance actually was involved in uh, several battles, but then came home and formed a guerrilla group uh, called the Logan Wildcats to help patrol the border between Virginia or West Virginia and Kentucky. Um, and the local high school actually takes their name from this today, uh, and so that kind of lives on. Um, the McCoys were from Kentucky, like I said, read by uh, Randall McCoy as their patriarch. Uh, Randall's brother, Harmon, uh, here fought for the Union, and uh, actually after his discharge in 1861, uh, a group of the Logan Wildcats killed him on his uh, return home, um, and this is kind of the spark that started this family feud that that has become famous. Uh, and um, Devil Ants was actually homesick at the time, but his uncle Jim Vance who was the one who led the killing party. Um, so this kind of, the feud smoldered, several legal battles took place over the ensuing years, uh, specifically between Devil Ants and Randall McCoy's cousin, Perry Klein, over 5,000 acres of land along the river. Um, but in the sign of kind of how long uh, the hills uh, around here hold grudges. 13 years later is when the, the next bloodshed occurred. And this is when the pig got involved. Um, so Floyd Hatfield, uh, who's Devil Ants' cousin, uh, and Randall McCoy got uh, in a, a dispute over a pig. And the way they uh, each family told their pigs apart is they would put specific notch patterns in the pig's ear. Um, so there was a dispute over what the actual pattern was and who owned the pig. Uh, and so this was taken to the local justice of the peace who happened to be Anderson, Preacher Ants, Hatfield. Um, so you can guess how he ruled. Um, and so after ruling in favor of the Hatfields, based on the testimony of Bill Stanton, who was actually a distant relative of both families, um, he, the two McCoy brothers uh, of, of Randall actually got into a fight with Stanton and ended up killing him in June, 1880. Um, they were later acquitted um, on grounds of self-defense, but this kind of kept the feud going over the years. Now, things really heated up in 1881 uh, when Rosie Ann McCoy, who is Randall's daughter, and John Z. Hatfield, who was Devil Ants' son, entered into a relationship in what could only be described as an Appalachian Juli Romeo and Juliet, Juliet at that time. Um, but the McCoys did not take kindly to this, obviously, so they abducted Johnsy, and this led to Rosianne kind of in a midnight panic running to Devil Ants' house, letting him know that his son had been abducted, and they uh, actually traveled over into Kentucky and uh, went to um, the McCoy household and, and rescued Johnsy. Now, Johnsy doesn't get off too easily. Um, he later uh, at, ended up leaving Rosianne for her cousin, Nancy McCoy, while Roseanne was pregnant with his child. So he's, he's probably not the nicest guy, obviously. Um, moving on, Devil Ants' brother ultimately was killed on election day in 1882. Um, got into a fight with three of the McCoy's boy, 
McCoy boys uh, of um, Tolbert, Farmer, and Bud. Got to love these names. Um, on election day, he was stabbed 26 times and shot. This led to uh, another Hatfield party um, going into Virginia or Kentucky and actually abducting these three uh, McCoy sons um, while they were on their way to Pikeville, Kentucky to stand trial, uh, brought them back into West Virginia, tied them up to a pawpaw tree and shot them. So the pawpaw comes back into to play here. Um, throughout the years, there were several more sporadic killings, um, Cap Hatfield and Fred Wolford, who was the constable and acting constable at the time, um, you know, ended up killing Jeff McCoy. Uh, and then um, uh, Tom Wallace was uh, later found dead uh, after being involved uh, uh, in the killing of Jeff McCoy. <clears throat> but the peak of the, the feud happened on New Year's Day, uh, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, 1888. Um, this is where Cap Hatfield and Jim Vance uh, led a raid uh, again back into um, Randall's house, um, set fire to the house, and then fired on the house, and that ended up killing two of the McCoy children, two, two young girls. Um, this got the Kentucky uh, government involved. The governor sent the adjutant general to investigate, and um, the local sheriff of Pike County uh, uh, established a raiding party and went into West Virginia, rounded up uh, uh, eight of the McCoy uh, or Hatfield, um, uh, who, eight of the Hatfields who were involved in the raiding party um, and um, arrested them, took them back into Kentucky uh, after, a, after an armed battle. They stood trial uh, August 20th. Um, of the eight who were involved in the trial, only one, um, Ellison Cottontop Mounts, who was uh, most likely an illegitimate child of um, Devil Ants, uh, was executed. Uh, he was the only one of the eight. He was hanged. Uh, everyone else was given life sentences. And this kind of ended the killing of the feud uh, and, and kind of you know, no other loss of life occurred after this. But there's a really great History Channel docuseries, docudrama, whatever you want to call it, on this. Um, which I thought did a really great job of telling the actual history of the of the feud without kind of portraying the typical stereotypes that sometimes we get um, with Kevin Cosner playing Devil Ants and Bill Paxton playing Randall McCoy. So if you ever get a chance to watch it, it's really good. Um, moving on, this one's kind of close to me. Um, the mine wars that occurred in the early, early 20th century um, uh, that involved a lot of prominent people that kind of have national names. Sid Hatfield here. Uh, which we'll get to, but was the great grandnephew uh, of Devil Ants Hatfield. Uh, Mary Mother Jones, who was initially from Ireland, but came over to the United States and was involved in a lot of the labor movement in the early 1900s. Uh, and Frank Keeney, who uh, is involved uh, in the creation of the United Mine Workers of America in West Virginia. Um, so this all started with the kind of poor working conditions that miners were struggling with at the time. Uh, following the Civil War, there were only about 16,000 miners in the state, but that boomed over 5,000 by the turn of the century. And uh, production went from 500,000 tons a year to over 90 million. So the miners began to demand better pay, safer work environments. Um, they dealt with a lot of company towns and conscription pay, um, which is um, pay that the company gave you that could only be spent in the company local coal uh, uh, store and you did not get paid in US dollars, you got paid in company script. Um, and a lot of the miners lived in kind of deplorable conditions, dilapidated housing. And so this led to multiple strikes uh, between in the, the teens, you know, around World War I. Uh, and tensions pulled over in 1920 um, with uh, 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 the uh, May 1 massacre that occurred. So uh, 300 miners in May 1, West Virginia, uh, went on strike uh, and joined the UMWA in April of that year. Uh, this subsequently led the local coal town uh, company to hire a private detective company, uh, Baldwin Feltz Detective Company. And on May 19th of that year, 13 of these detectives rode a train into town to evict the miners from their housing. Um, uh, this led to uh, a battle in May 1. Um, the mayor, uh, Testerman, uh, Smiling Sid Hatfield, who was the sheriff of the town at the time, and his deputy sheriff, Fred uh, Burgraff. Uh, they met the uh, detectives from Baldwin Feltz on the steps of a local hardware store. 
unsure who shot first, uh, but when it stopped, seven of the uh, detectives were dead, and so was the mayor and two local miners who were there as well. Um, this kind of propelled Sid Hatfield into a national hero for the labor movement. Um, he then worked with some of the other major proponents, such as um, uh, Mother Jones that we talked about, um, and um, worked to try to improve labor uh, in, the, in the mines locally. Um, but the Baldwin Feltz agency held a grudge because the owner of the company lost two of his brothers in this, in, in this shootout. And when a, uh, a coal tipple blew up in Mohawk, West Virginia, which is right where I'm from, this happened right in my backyard almost, um, the, the Baldwin Feltz detectives claimed that Sid Hatfield was involved. Now, he was almost all likelihood framed, but this led to his arrest, and he presented to the McDowell County Courthouse on August 1st, 1921 in Welch, West Virginia. Um, and he was with his wife at the time, walking up these steps to present for his trial, pretrial hearing, uh, and several Baldwin Feltz agents approached him as he was coming up the steps. They were coming from behind the courthouse this way, uh, met him on the steps and shot him dead right on the steps in front of the courthouse. Uh, the bullet holes are still in the stairs to this day that you can go see. Um, this led to obviously a large uh, uproar from the miners as one of their, their prominent leaders uh, was killed. Uh, and this led to uh, calls for a march on Charleston. Um, <clears throat> Frank Keeney, who was the local UMWA uh, representative at that time, met with the governor, uh, but their demands were not met. Uh, so 13,000 uh, miners gathered in Logan County, West Virginia, and planned to march north to Charleston um, by force. Mother Jones was involved. She gathered uh, and helped uh, lead a mass mobilization. The miners wore red bandanas around their necks to kind of signify uh, that they were all together uh, so they could tell you know, who was with them and who wasn't. Uh, and they were ultimately termed the Redneck Army. Uh, and this is where that term comes from uh, that, that is used today. Um, they were met by a private militia organized by the coal companies at uh, Blair Mountain uh, in right on the border of uh, Logan and Boone County. Um, and this led to fighting and what was ultimately termed the Battle of Blair Mountain. Uh, the fighting commenced on August 25th. Um, and it was not true, one true big battle, but multiple skirmishes uh, across the mountain throughout the days. Um, and it ultimately led to federal troops being mobilized and sent in to quell the rebellion. Um, and on September 2nd, the federal, uh, the U.S. Army arrived, and this led to the miners just surrendering uh, because most of the miners were them selves um, uh, World War I veterans, and they couldn't bring themselves to fire on, on U.S. Army troops. Uh, this led to a short-term defeat um, uh, for, the, for the miners and, and a victory for the coal company as the, the, the miners had to disperse. Um, but this raised public awareness as it was in the, the uh, newspapers throughout the country, uh, raised awareness for mining conditions, and ultimately led to the, the growth of the United Mine Workers, the United Steel Workers, and the labor and safety improvements in the 1930s. I know unions today can be a dirty word for some people, but at this time, these unions were instrumental uh, in, in improving miner safety and, and labor safety at the time. And I tell this story, too, because during all this time, uh, Grandfather uh, was involved in, in coal mining, obviously, where I'm from, and he, uh, my grandmother used to tell me stories about uh, agents similar to the Baldwin Feltz agents going up and down the haulers and, at night and shooting at people's houses and yelling and threatening them not to join the union. So this is kind of uh, hits, hits close to home for me. Uh, one final person I want to talk about who's been in the news a little bit with uh, some uh, a movie is uh, Miss Catherine Johnson, born Catherine Coleman, uh, 1918 in White Sulphur Springs. If anybody's read the book or watched the movie, Hidden Figures, you, you already know about her, but I, I think she has a great story. Um, she, her father worked for the Greenbrier Hotel, uh, which is the resort now. Um, and he was a handyman, a carpenter, just did uh, a, a little bit of everything for them. Um, but she early on showed a strong aptitude for mathematics and ended up attending West Virginia State College uh, just outside of Charleston, which is one of the two historically black colleges and universities in West Virginia. Um, just of note, both of those historically black colleges in the state now have over 90% uh, white student population. 
Um, so it kind of shows the West Virginia has really a lack of diversity and, and you know, I don't know what it says other than their their public institutions and, and are involved in making the state better, but um, uh, I'll just leave that as it is. But she ended up attending West Virginia University uh, for graduate in mathematics and became the first African-American woman to graduate from here. Um, she got a job in 1953 uh, for the precursor to NASA uh, and was working in segregated um, uh, conditions at that time because uh, there were federal work rules still in a place from the Wilson administration at the turn of the century. Um, in 61, she calculated Alan Shepard's Mercury trajectory, who was the first American to uh, enter space. And shortly thereafter, uh, even though um, uh, NASA had begun using computers to calculate uh, trajectories. She double checked John Glenn's Mercury 6 orbit, who was the first uh, American to orbit uh, Earth. And John Glenn actually would not go into space until Catherine John his, his the computer's calculations. She was later involved uh, instrumental in the Apollo program uh, and uh, the Apollo 13 used her, her um, backup trajectories to return um, those astronauts back safely after that um, explosion. Um, later on, she worked on space shuttle satellites and the Mars mission. She received numerous awards throughout her life, uh, honorary doctorates from multiple universities, the Congressional Gold Medal, medal and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And again, uh, if you want to read a little bit more about her life and the um, other computers with skirts, as they were termed at the time, at the Langley Aeronautical Laboratory, uh, there's a book and a movie. Um, and then finally, just uh, quickly, since we're running out of time, a uh, little bit on the history of the school here. So the first medical school building uh, was in 1887, the Hick House. It was in the 14 by 20 foot uh, building, cost $350 at the time to construct. It had space for 10 cadavers uh, that they used for anatomy. Uh, 1903 started the first time full medical curriculum. Uh, there were two years in Morgantown. And then two years, uh, uh, the last two years were in Baltimore at the College of Physicians, which is now Maryland's medical school. Uh, in 1951, the state realized they needed probably a new hospital, uh, a university hospital and a medical center. So they passed the uh, quote unquote pop tax, which was a one cent tax on pop to fund the building, the building that most of us are in now, the Health Science Center. This was built next to the Morgantown Golf and Country Club, which was a golf course right where the football stadium is now. And you can see some people enjoying a little bit of golf with the um, uh, HSC being built in the background. By 1980, we had outgrown that. Uh, and so uh, then President Gordon Gee, uh, who was the university president in 1980, president now, came back for a second term, um, created a new pu public-private partnership um, and that created WVU Hospital Entity, which is now WVU Medicine. Um, but that, and combined with an $8 million gift from J.W. Ruby posthumously from his wife, allowed the creation of the hospital, which you can see the stadium here, the HSC in the background, and the, the, universe, the, the hospital being built here. And that's all I have. Anybody has any questions? Thank you for your time, and uh, thank you for letting me talk about the state I love so much. Yeah, if if I remember.